I think it's safe to say that this month has certainly been an eventful one for Mars One, so this update will be slightly longer than the usual. The main event that everyone's talking about is the Mars One feasibility debate, which was held at the 18th annual Mars Society Convention over in Washington DC. I'll be getting to the specifics of the debate in just a moment, but firstly though, I just wanted to provide a high-level overview of my own personal experiences from attending the convention. So I set off for the States on August 12th, and after a brief stay over in Iceland, I landed in the capital around 10 hours later. Now at first I seem to remember being somewhat bewildered by this strange thing, what was it called? Oh yes, sunlight. That's so, somewhat um, odd from being in cloudy England of course all the time, but I was fortunate enough to be picked up by my fellow Mars 100 candidates, Yari and R. Daniel, who then took me over to the hotel where I would be spending the rest of my time during the convention. After arriving in the capital, I got quite the surprise when entering a crowded hotel room containing six of my fellow Mars 100 candidates from as far as Canada, Mexico and even Italy. The weird thing was that, although we'd never actually met each other in person by that point, it was kind of like we were already halfway through a conversation because of how actively we are always in communication with the other candidates from across the world. The thing that really struck me is that, although we come from completely different backgrounds and in some cases have radically different life experiences, we just seem to immediately bond, which I think really bodes well for the teamwork aspects which will form part of the next round of the selection process. The convention itself kicked off the next morning with an opening statement from Dr. Robert Zubrin, the president of the Mars Society and author of The Case for Mars, which Dr. Zubrin was kind enough to sign for me. <laughs> So each day of the convention featured a number of great keynotes on a wide variety of topics surrounding human and robotic missions to Mars, as well as track talks on various specialist topics and a number of panel discussions. Most of these are now online over at the Mars Society's YouTube channel, a link to which you'll find in the description down below. Mars One's involvement with the convention revolved around three distinct events. Firstly, a panel discussion with American Mars 100 candidates Sonia, Oscar and Layla discussing the Mars 1 project and their motivations behind being involved. Secondly, a debate on the feasibility of Mars 1, on the one hand between Mars 1 CEO Bars Lansdorp and one of the Paragon Space Development Corporation's chief engineers Barry Finger, whilst on the opposition to them were two MIT PhD candidates Sidney Doe and Andrew Owens. So, in order to keep the public engaged with the proceedings as they were going on, myself, Yari and R. Daniel set up a live stream over Periscope that was showing what was going on behind the scenes both before, during and after all of these events for a number of hours. So this included, for instance, interviews with conference attendees, the candidates, as well as a number of interviews with bars. So, and that was certainly an interesting experience. It was somewhat experimental for Mars One, but it seemed to be a success. Particularly, we had a great reception over Twitter for the live Q&A sessions that we organised. So you can expect to see more of these live streams in future at various other events Mars One will be involved in. If you want to keep an eye out for when one of these is scheduled, or to actually find the links to watch one of these Periscope feeds, the best thing to do is to follow at Mars One Project over on Twitter and to keep an eye out. So I'll of course post a link to all three of the videos for these Mars One events down in the description, and also to a cut of some of the Periscope footage from one of the interviews I had with Bars. Now onto the meat of the discussion, the Mars One feasibility debate. If you haven't had a chance to watch the debate yet, it's around two hours in total, I'll post a link down below to a great concise article over on space.com that summarises the key points made by both sides during the debate. You can also check out a recent video I've posted where my fellow candidate Oscar Matthews gives his own verdict on the debate. You can just check that out just over there. So my own verdict, well, to be perfectly honest with you, I found the debate rather disappointing. So. I can tell you that from running a debating society in Oxford that a formal debate simply does not work if both sides are using different definitions and as a consequence basically speaking at right angles to each other throughout the entire thing. But anyway, let, let's just take a look at the performance of both sides, what at least I think they did well and what could be improved. 
So the debate started off with a statement from the MIT students. And I do have to say, honestly, they did a pretty good job. They had a really well presented PowerPoint that really illustrated and complemented their key points. Their main points being that if you don't have a local manufacturing base established on Mars, then resupply shipments costs grow linearly over time. They also raise concerns about the entry, descent and landing capabilities required for the various modules in Mars One's mission plan and about the overall programmatic cost. Their conclusion was that if the Mars One mission cannot be accomplished for $6 billion within a 12 year time window, then it is infeasible. I'll admit, I find this to be a somewhat odd notion of feasibility. Whilst I agree that the probability of Mars One achieving the first human landing within $6 billion is vanishingly small, and one potential reason for that being that Paragon recently estimated the mass of the Eclis module would be a fair bit higher than Mars One originally envisioned, and obviously higher mass drives up costs. But with me, the notion of feasibility seems to be intimately tied in to the concept of technological capability. Now, of course, I am not a systems engineer. I'm an astrophysicist. So allow me to elaborate on what I mean with a case study from my own field, the James Webb Space Telescope. This is designed to be the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. It's due to launch in 2018 for a total budget of $8 billion. However, it should have launched in 2011, according to original plans, and for a maximum budget of $1.6 billion. So it's already over four times over budget and running potentially seven or even more years behind. Just because it is over budget does not make it infeasible. I mean, you can call it infeasible by that definition, but that does not change the fact that when James Webb launches, it will be observing the first starlight in the universe. It will be observing the formation of galaxies and their subsequent evolution, and it will be obtaining spectra from nearby exoplanet atmospheres. James Webb would be infeasible if the state-of-the-art mirror grinding technology was not sufficient to produce the required minimum angular resolution to accomplish the scientific tasks, then it's perfectly fair to call it infeasible, because it basically means you cannot accomplish the science or the goals, it's not possible. So just talking about feasibility in terms of technological drivers seems at least to me to be sensible. And so I was hoping for more discussions along the lines of the technologies to enable human settlement of Mars during the debate, and uh, less about the definitions of words. Over on Mars One's side, Mars's main communication points revolved around the project being in pre-phase A, to use the aerospace terminology, and so they fully expect various aspects of the mission to change and develop over time as concept studies are completed by various aerospace partner organisations such as Lockheed Martin or Paragon. So Bars focused very much on the business side of affairs and not on the technical details, which is, as I mentioned earlier, they were just speaking about different things throughout the debate. What I would have liked to see here, and, and honestly, I think this was just missed potential on Mars One's part, would have been a dialogue between Paragon's Barry Finger and the MIT students on the technical feasibility of Mars One's Eclis design and in situ resource utilization for usage on Mars. And the reason for this is because this is, to date, the only fully published conceptual design study on a key technical area of Mars One's mission plan. I perfectly understand Barza's position that, for instance, you can't really go into and discuss the intricate technical details of entry, descent and landing until Mars One has carried out the study with Lockheed Martin on that, but with Paragon, you already have one of those studies. And so to have a chief engineer of Paragon there, and then just not to have that discussion seems somewhat superfluous. So if there was one thing that really surprised me about the debate, it must have been the different communication style on the part of the MIT students. Because one of the great things that I really liked about the report they published last October is that when you read it, it sounds like, okay, here are some problems we've identified now let's look at potential solutions so we can all go to Mars one day. Whilst in the debate it seemed more just like bam bam bam, list loads of problems. So for example, when stating, without an established manufacturing base on Mars, resupply shipments grow unsustainably in cost over time, which is of course a valid point and it's an important point to make, the logical next step would be to say, great, 
So here's what we might be able to do to fix it. I think this was most starkly illuminated when a member of the audience asked Sydney for constructive feedback on how much money and time it would take in order for Mars One to become feasible by his standards. And well, to be frank, he kind of just sidestepped the question. But I mean, you have to be right, there was a lot of sidestepping going on on both sides. And also the old politician's trick, you know, of answering a different question than the one that was asked. To the point where there were some times being sat there in that debate when it was easy to forget that everyone on that panel were actually engineers. That being said, the debate itself and my interviews with Bars offered plenty of insights into the current state of Mars One's mission plan. So at this moment in time, Mars One is working on a $15 million investment deal that will be used to build a an active technical staff of 25 new employees, fund all of the remaining pre-phase A concept studies, which incidentally includes the aforementioned EDL study by Lockheed Martin that I'm very interested to see, to build the simulation outpost, and also to fund Lockheed Martin to move forward into phase A for the 2020 demonstration lander. So overall, this $15 million investment will fund all of Mars One's necessary activities over the next two years to move the program forward. So during an extended interview, which I held with Bars after his talk, which I mean, unfortunately, the footage for that was corrupted because the phone we were recording the periscope on crashed. But anyway, the point is that Bars said during this interview that I had with him that he envisions the challenge of funding the full construction of the 2020 lander to be about the same in terms of order of magnitude difficulty as the current task that he's just finalizing with funding this $15 million round. The reason for that being that it's approximately 10 times more funding to actually construct the 2020 lander as opposed to just complete the phase A study of it. But then it's 10 times easier to attract investors because you actually have all the technical concept studies done by that point. So the two effects roughly cancel out. As to the timeline of receiving the money to begin this process in earnest, Bars mentioned that he's looking at a window of between October and the end of this year. Now, those of you who are regular viewers of these updates on this channel will recall that this is decisively less optimistic than the situation earlier this year, which I suppose just comes with the territory of having to rely on private investors. Things are still moving forward, of course, but there are limits to what I can say at this time. What I can tell you, though, is that Bars stated confidently that a press release will be issued when the $15 million for this current next phase is in the bank for Mars One. There are actually some promising signs already of Mars One partnering with established brands and organizations, which is in order to raise the profile of the organization as well as to secure funds for the mission. With one example from the past month being a partnership announced with the fashion brand Bjorn Borg, in fact, so this, this so I find this somewhat amusing, but um, Bjorn Borg have dedicated their spring and summer 2016 collection to Mars One's concept of a one-way mission to Mars. So on August 24th, Bjorn Borg held a training for Mars fashion show at Stockholm in Sweden, where Mars One candidates Alex and Hannah from the UK, Christian from Denmark and Bradley from Belgium were all invited to attend. Now, as with the Mars Society convention, the candidates who were there broadcast live over Periscope in order to engage the wider public with the proceedings and show what was going on behind the scenes. So though at first glance this partnership might seem somewhat odd, I mean they're not anything to do with aerospace for instance, it's a cultural organisation at best, what it represents is Mars One gaining increasing recognition in the wider world of business. Speaking of wider recognition, you'll probably be hearing a lot about Mars One over the next few days, as the five-part Engadget documentary series Citizen Mars is going to be released by AOL tomorrow. Now, there's a great cast of five candidates scattered across four different continents around the world featured in this series, so I'm really excited to finally see it come to light. If you can't wait though, I'll post a link to the trailer down in the description below, or you can check it out just over here actually as well. 
But finally, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to a long time subscriber of this channel and also to thank him. So this is to Ju Chang, and apologies if I pronounce your name wrong, who kindly offered to give me a tour around MIT when I stopped by in Boston after the end of the Mars Society convention. Thanks very much for that, because it also afforded me a chance to meet three of my fellow Mars 100 candidates who are local to the Boston area, meaning that I've now actually met 25 of the Mars 100 in person, which was a great conclusion to my first time in the United States. Thanks for watching. If you're new to this channel, I produce Mars One mission updates around the end of each month, as well as content on human spaceflight and planetary science. This month's feature video is the excellent Mars 100 panel discussion from the Mars Society Convention, which I highly recommend you take a look at. I'll be a little distant though over September since I'm going to New Zealand for a fortnight on Friday, but please keep sending in your comments, follow me on Twitter, and be sure to subscribe to keep up to date with the latest developments in the Mars One mission.